I would like to welcome virtually um, Dr. Simon Kopp. And Simon actually worked on the European Research Council project um, that is sponsoring this work on the English Franciscans and the Sumahalensis uh, last year before going on to take up a position as visiting lecturer in the International Theological Institute in Austria. We are also working with the Catholic Church um, in your diocese. And uh, Simon's work has been on providence in Thomas Aquinas. And while he was working uh, on the project and working very hard to produce, I'd just like to show you our two recent edited volumes on the Summa Lenses, which are available free um, through open access on the DeGreuter website. Simon invested an enormous amount of work in bringing these to completion. But while you were doing that, you were also uh, got interested in the idea of providence in the Summa Hellensis as the background for Aquinas's thought um, and came to some quite exciting and interesting conclusions. So um, I'm excited to have at least one paper in our series right now on the Summa Hellensis. Um, and thank you so much for your willingness to share that with us. So I think I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So the title and topic of my paper is Providence in the Summa Hallensis between authority and innovation. The doctrine of providence features prominently in the 13th century early Franciscan Summa Hallensis. In this paper, I will argue that the account of providence presented in the Summa is an innovative reworking of past authorities and may thus be counted among the examples of early Franciscan innovations. I will show that while John of Damascus claimed that providence is part of God's will and Peter Lombard took providence to be a specific form of divine knowledge, the Summa Hallensis applies the Boethian notion of the ratio of providence to harmonize the two authorities terming the corresponding executio government. Thus the distinction between providence and gubernatio, so central to Thomas Aquinas' doctrine of providence, is to be found initially in the Summa Hallensis. Section one, the definition of providence, a synthesis of the Damascene and the Lombard. The standard scholastic definitions of providence and related terms at the time were pro provided by Peter Lombard in the sentences, on which various medieval theologians, including the authors of the Summa Hallensis, commented, and which they integrated differently into their theological systems. Hubert Neufeld notes in this connection that the authors of the Summa do not often follow the scheme of the Lombard in the way other scholastic authors do, rarely taking a passage from the sentences explicitly as an occasion to treat a theological question. The tractate on divine providence and divine knowledge more generally appears to be an exception. In fact, the approach of the Summa will become clear once we have examined the background provided by Peter Lombard's sentences, to which we will now turn. Section two, the Lombard and the terminological definitions in the sentences. Peter Lombard sets the scene for the subsequent medieval debates about providence by introducing the basic terminology for this purpose in distinction 35 of the first book of the sentences. The Summa Hallensis will comment extensively on this understanding of providence. In his treatise on God as the cause of creation in the first book, the Lombard discusses divine knowledge, divine power, and the divine will in that order. The context of his discussion of providence is God's knowledge or wisdom. Peter effectively presents divine providence and related terms as a species of divine knowledge. He states, quotation number one, God's wisdom and knowledge is called not only knowledge, but also foreknowledge, or foresight, disposition, predestination, and providence. And foreknowledge or foresight concerns only future things, but all of them, namely good and evil ones. Disposition concerns things that are to be done. Predestination concerns all who are to be safe, as well as the good things by which these are freed in this life and will be crowned in the future. 
providence is concerned with governance and it seems to be taken entirely in the same way as disposition. And yet sometimes providence is taken for foreknowledge. Wisdom and knowledge, however, concern all things, namely good and evil ones, evil and present, past and future, and not only temporal things, but also eternal ones." End of quote. According to Peter Lombard, consequently, there are two sets of related terms. On the one hand, foreknowledge, foresight, disposition, predestination, providence, all concern the future in one way or the other. Wisdom and knowledge, on the other hand, relate in the case of God to all temporal and not only future things, as well as to eternal ones. Within the first set, foreknowledge and foresight must be distinguished from disposition, predestination, and providence. Foreknowledge or foresight concerns all future things, whether good or bad, while the remainder is concerned only with future things that are good in some respect. Disposition has to do with things to be done or made, as we will see later below. And providence pertains to things to be governed, gubernandorum. The latter is closely linked to or taken to be identical with disposition. The Lombard also notes an alternative interpretation according to which providence is divine foreknowledge. Despite this regarding providence, the favored option suggests that providence implies some goodness and a reference to the future. In Lombard's view, then, providence is a form of divine knowledge, one that implies reference to the future and probably to the good. So construed, providence pertains to and is a form of God's wisdom. Section three, the Lombardian structure of the exposition of providence in the Summa Hallensis. The Summa Hallensis treatise on providence is situated within its first book and more specifically the tractate on divine knowledge, which is preceded by a discussion of divine power and followed by one of the divine will. The structure is accordingly power, knowledge, will. In comparison to the sentences, therefore, the power of God comes to the fore. For, as pointed out previously, in the sentences, the order was knowledge power will. Following the basic terminological distinctions of the sentences, the Summa Hallensis tractate on divine knowledge is divided into two main sections, which respectively treat the knowledge of God in his own right, or absolutely considered, and knowledge of God in relation to other things, or relatively considered. In a section concerning divine knowledge relatively considered, the Summa deals with the divine foreknowledge before moving on to divine disposition, divine providence, and finally divine predestination. The Summa follows then not only to a considerable extent the structure of the sentences, but also adopts its approach in terms of divine knowledge and basic definitions. In the preface to the section on divine knowledge relatively considered, we read as follows, quote two. Having examined divine knowledge in an absolute sense, it behooves to inquire into it in relation to other things. For in relation to future things, it is called foreknowledge. In relation to things to be made, disposition. In relation to things to be ruled, providence. In relation to things to be safe, predestination. Accordingly, the Summa Hallensis structures the material as follows. First, Descientia de Relate ad Futura, divine foreknowledge. Second, Descientia de Relate ad Facienda, divine disposition. Third, Descientia de Relate ad Regenda, divine providence and fate. Fourth, Descientia de Relate ad Salvanda, divine predestination, reprobation, election, love, and the book of life. Two authorities are cited in support of Lombard's distinctions. Hugh of St. Victor is held to define divine knowledge, foreknowledge, disposition, predestination, and providence as follows. Quote three. Knowledge is of existing things, foreknowledge of future things, 
disposition of things to be made, predestination of things to be saved, providence of subjected things. According to the Koraki editors, a second implicit source is Peter of Poitiers, who distinguishes the term knowledge as it refers to the divine essence from the temporal aspect of the preposition for knowledge, as it refers to a temporal relation in creatures. Accordingly, the Summa explains that if we abstract from the temporal aspect, then we refer to divine knowledge by the name wisdom or knowledge. The difference being that, uh, sorry, then we refer to the divine knowledge by the name knowledge or wisdom. The difference being that the former concerns the effect known through the cause, whereas the latter concerns the cause itself. But if the temporal dimension of creatures is considered, then it is referred to as foreknowledge, disposition, predestination, or providence. Under the name foreknowledge, divine knowledge extends to both good and evil, but under the names disposition, predestination, and providence, it only relates to good things, although in different respects. Disposition signifies the good of nature in coming to be, or as being made in fiere. Whereas providence signifies the good of nature in being, or as having been made in facto esse. Predestination, however, signifies not the good of nature, but the good of grace. The fourth statement is essentially Lombard's position, further specified in the latter part by the distinction between in fieri and in facto esse, in order to distinguish providence from disposition. In this, the Summa Hallensis goes beyond the Lombard. Section four, adopting John of Damascus' definition of providence. In addition to Peter Lombard, the Summa Hallensis draws here, as in other cases, on the defide orthodox of John of Damascus, who is known for passing down the Greek theological tradition, and in this instance draws in turn on the account of providence in Nemesius De Natura Hominis. John's work had been translated into the Latin by Burgundio of Pisa in the 12th century and was gaining in authority during this period, not least due to the similarities with the Lombard in terms of theological topics covered. In the De Fide Orthodoxa, John defines providence as divine care over created things, an act following from and pertaining to the will of God. He writes, quote four, providence then is the solicitude which God has for existing things. And he goes on to explain, providence is that will of God by which all existing things receive suitable guidance through to their end. This statement implies that providence pertains to God's will. In fact, on John's view, providence is God's will. The Damascene's definition of providence was subsequently invoked by the authors of the Summa Hallensis, who interpret providence and hence divine knowledge concerning things to be governed, that is the gubernandorum of Peter Lombard, as a form of divine care. Over and again, we read in one form or another that providence is care, cura. In defining providence as care, the authors of the Summa effectively adopt John of Damascus' definition as rendered into the Latin by the Burgundio translation as their own. Quote five, providence is the care which God has for existing things. In explicating the statement, providentia est gubernandorum as providentia est cura, the Summa Hallensis thus combines two past authorities, namely Peter Lombard and John of Damascus. Section five, adopting the adopted positions. The Summa Hallensis then starts explicating and adapting the adopted positions. Based on quotations from Boethius, John of Damascus, the Lombard and scripture, the Summa Hallensis discusses five prominent positions as to what providence is or that to which it pertains. 
These positions suggest that providence might be identical with disposition or fate, or it might pertain to God's wisdom, will, or power. The same five positions will be discussed by Thomas Aquinas in his commentary on the sentences, where he was among the first to introduce the topic of providence in distinction 39. What is more, the arguments for each position, quoting four out of five times the same authorities, are initially to be found in the Summa Hallensis. Like Aquinas, the Summa argues that providence is neither identical with this position nor with fate, nor does it pertain to power rather than to wisdom or will. Providence is a form of divine knowledge in its own right, conjoined with the will and distinct from both fate and disposition. This is number one. Providence is not or not really divine disposition. The Summa Hallensis draws a couple of noteworthy distinctions to differentiate the closely related terms wisdom, disposition, providence, and government. According to the Summa, disposition is divine foreknowledge of things to be made with the scope of them being made. So things to be made with the scope of them being made. The Summa thus further specifies Peter Lombard's definition of this disposition as foreknowledge of things to be made by distinguishing wisdom from disposition along the following lines. First, knowledge of things to be made is twofold. Someone might have knowledge that something is worthy of being made or knowledge with the scope of it being made. Accordingly, Wisdom is knowledge of things to be made insofar as they are worthy of being made. Disposition, by contrast, is knowledge of things to be made with the scope of making it. Hence, whereas wisdom is a judgment that something would be good to be made, the notion of disposition adds the intention of making it. Second, Although both disposition and providence concern the actual being of things, they're not identical in their meaning. For disposition concerns the being of a thing with the scope of making it, or insofar as it is, as it is being made, whereas providence concerns the being of a thing after it is made, or insofar as it has been made, furthering their conservation or perfection. In other words, the coming of a being, in other words, the coming of a thing into being, fieri ad esse, or bringing it into existence, is subject to divine disposition. But the becoming of a thing in being, fieri in esse, the ruling of a thing in existence, is subject to government or providence depending on whether the ruling of a thing in being concerns the continuation of being, gubernatio, or the ordination of being, providentia. In this specific sense, then, the Summa Hallensis defines providence as follows, quote number six, providence is disposition at least insofar as it is said with respect to the fieri in esse, that is, ruling a thing in being. Thesis number two, providence is not fate. Following Boethius, the Summa distinguishes between fate and providence. Fate differs from providence in that the former refers to reality in created things, whereas the latter refers to the ratio exemplaris in God. Providence is the exemplar reason in the divine art, but fate is the created effect of God's action. Just like a disposition in the one disposing is not identical to the disposition of the thing disposed, so too providence as the exemplar is not identical to fate as the instantiation of the exemplar. 
Fate, however, can denote either the pagan law of the stars or the Boethian inherent disposition in the things moved by providence. While the former is rejected as an erroneous belief, the Summa defends and expands on the latter view in a separate treatise on fate, which is based on Alexander of Hale's De Fato, added right after discussion of providence. Having explained what providence is not, the Summa then turns to the controversial question as to which divine attribute providence pertains. As Marcia Kolisch observes, there is not a clear consensus across the period as to which divine attribute this constellation of ideas should be seen as illustrating. Thesis number three. Providence does not pertain to God's power, but to his wisdom and will. The Summa maintains that divine providence contains two elements. The Summists argue that providere derives from videre. To see, however, implies cognition. Cognition is the first and fundamental dimension of providence. But the notion of providence adds a causal aspect to divine knowledge insofar as the videre in question is the pro -videre. The summa takes the preposition pro to imply a form of causality, namely an ordering and governing one. So the second element of providence is causality. While the former and fundamental epistemic dimension of providence concerns, according to the Summa, God's intellect, the latter superadded causal dimension pertains to God's will. The Summist state, quote seven. Providence provides, literally foresees, and orders or governs. This seeing pertains to wisdom, but this order and government is from the highest goodness and will. On the Summa's account then, providence is first and foremost knowledge or cognition, as the Lombard argues, and as such, it pertains to or is reducible to God's wisdom. And secondarily, it is causality, and as such pertains to or is reducible to God's will or his goodness, as the Damascene suggested. By contrast, the Summa rejects the view attributing providence to God's power, at least insofar it is, as, as it is distinguished from God's wisdom and will. On this account, power at best denotes God's ability or capacity to enact his wisdom and will. In summary, the Summa Hallensis concludes that providence pertains fundamentally to God's wisdom. But in terms of its realization, it depends on God's will. In this manner, the Summa seeks to explain and account for John of Damascus' description of providence as care and God's good will. Although it may therefore seem successfully to reconcile two seemingly conflicting authorities, namely the Lombard and Damascene, there is an interesting challenge which arises from this innovative synthesis of Peter Lombard and John of Damascus, which calls for further scrutiny. Section six, the challenge, a challenge and its solution. The tension concerns the question of how we are to reconcile the two dimensions of providence which the Summa Hallensis posits, to wit, the cognitive and the causative, which pertain to God's wisdom and will, respectively, in God. The Summa eases this tension by invoking a remarkable distinction which soon afterwards will become crucial for the further um, crucial for the further history of the doctrine of providence, which is a distinction which is found in one of the Summa's sources. In the Divinis Nominibus, 
John of La Rochelle introduces providence as the precognition of that which is to be governed, which he distinguishes from the execution of that which has been provided. Quote eight. Providence is defined in two ways. In one way, it refers to the precognition of that which is to be governed and how. And in another way, it refers to the execution of that which has been provided. The context of John's argument is the question of how to reconcile the claims of the Lombard and the Damascene, that providence is divine knowledge and the divine will, respectively. The distinction between the two modes of providence supports the conclusion that providence pertains to both, namely, as providence in the first mode to God's knowledge, and as providence in the second mode to God's will. The will in a way executes the things which are providentially ordered and in the way they are ordered in God's knowledge. The Summa Hallensis introduces a similar but slightly modified distinction when differentiating between providence as the divine reason by which all things are governed and government as the execution of providence. Quote nine, the providence of God refers, properly speaking, to the divine reason, divina ratio, by which all things are governed. And in this way, the providence of God exists only by itself. In another way, providence refers to the execution of providence, namely the government, gubernatio itself. And this is for the most part through a creature. The immediate context of the distinction here is the question of whether God's providence is mediated through creatures, per creatura. The Summa argues that providence in the strict sense is immediate to God, whereas the execution of providence is mediated through creatures, where through, per, is to be understood as by the power and authority of God and not of their own accord. Providence thereby moves in the form of the execution, which is conceptually distinguished from the divine reason in God, into creation, partially crossing the creator-creature divide, while remaining, as this divine reason, an attribute of God. Two things are noteworthy in this connection. First, the Summa identifies providence in the strict sense as the divina ratio. Second, the Summa terms the execution of providence gubernatio. Thus the Summa clearly distinguishes between providence as the divine reason in God and government as the execution of providence, which happens for the most part through the mediation of creaturely causes. Moreover, while providence as the divina ratio is a reality in God's wisdom or knowledge, the latter execution through secondary causes elaborates further on the causal aspect resulting from God's will. Concerning the mode of providence, the Summa Hallensis teaches that providence is not wholly eternal, but has, a certain, but has in a certain way a temporal aspect. As noted already, on the Summa's account, providence implies both cognition and causation. Now, insofar as providence is considered under the cognitive dimension, it is said to be eternal. It is also eternal insofar as the causative aspect is concerned in habit, cura in habitu, or to the extent to which the providence the providential care refers to God's essence being able to govern creatures. But providence is temporal insofar as this causality is enacted, cura in actu. Thus the Summa states that the view of providence is from eternity, but its causality, 
insofar as it is called in act is in time. From this statement, it can be inferred that providence as the divina ratio is eternal, whereas government as the execution of providence, at least if executed through secondary causes, is temporal, although not insofar as the execution of providence is habitually in God's will. As is well known, the distinction between providence and government, arguably prefigured in the Summa Hallensis, is among the main building blocks of Thomas Aquinas' theory of providence and has since become the hallmark of the subsequent Thomist tradition of the theory of um, providence. In his Summa Theologiae, Aquinas introduces providence as the, as the reason for the order of things provided for to an end, and government as the execution of this order. Quote number 10. Two things pertain to providence, namely, the reason of the order of things provided for to an end, the ratio ordinis rerum provisarum in finem, and the execution of this order, executio huius ordinis, which is called government, gubernatio. As in the Summa Hallensis, the context is the question of the immediacy of God's providence. Similar to the Summa Hallensis, Aquinas teaches that providence is immediate to God, whereas his government is ordinarily mediated through secondary causes executing his providential ordering. That second, providence is eternal, whereas government is temporal, and finally, that both providence and government are universal, but fate as the providential order existing in the governing secondary causes, implying a mediated uh, execution, is not. Moreover, like the Summa Hallensis, Aquinas calls providence the divine ratio and terms its execution gubernatio. While the initial context of John of La Rochelle's discussion seems inextricably linked to the Franciscan synthesis of John of Damascus and Peter Lombard, and the Summa Hallensis appropriation of the modified distinction in a new context is still encapsulated in the Lombardian structure, Thomas Aquinas will systematically develop in his mature writing the explanatory power of the distinction for the explication of the doctrine of providence. Nonetheless, the similarity between the Dominican Thomas Aquinas and the Franciscans John of La Rochelle and Alexander of Hales is striking in this instance, down to the very wording of the distinction of providence and government. Divina ratio qua cuncta gubernantur et executio providentia in the Summa Hallensis and ratio gubernationis rerum in mente divina and executio providentia in Thomas Aquinas's commentary on the sentences. Although this comment is not meant to imply a textual dependence of Aquinas on the Summa Hallensis, the previously discussed evidence of John of La Rochelle and more importantly, the Summa Hallensis suggests that the distinction was being employed at the University of Paris by Franciscan contemporaries at the time Aquinas wrote his commentary on the sentences. In fact, as already mentioned, Aquinas was among the first to introduce providence as a separate question in his sentence commentary, where we find the distinction between uh, providentia and gubernatio for the first time in his writing. Section seven, an objection. Now, one might say that this distinction comes, in fact, from Boethius, another important source of the Summa Hallensis, and in one sense, this is true. But I will show that in another respect, the evidence best supports it being an innovation of the Summa. As seen previously, the Summa holds fate in the Boethian sense to be distinct from providence. In fact, if providence is the divine reason in God, which disposes all things, as the Summa notes, then this would seem to speak against the view that God provides for creatures through creatures. By contrast, 
the summa takes the Boethian notion of fate to be a correlate to their notion of government. Maintaining the Boethian distinction between the divine reason and creaturely dispositions, the summa interprets Boethius as saying that if providence is taken as the divine reason, then no creature administers in it. But if it is taken as the disposition inherent in creatures, then it is, it is administered by creatures, which the Summa terms an execution. So while Boethius' famous distinction of providence and fate is indeed an important and explicit source of the Summa's distinction between providence and government, they're arguably not identical. In the De Consolazione Philosophia, we read, quote number 11. Providence is the divine reason, divina ratio itself, established in the highest ruler of all things, the reason which disposes all things that exist. But fate is a disposition inherent in movable things, through which providence binds all things together, each in its own proper ordering. Now, although these are different, yet the one depends on the other, for the order of fate proceeds from the simplicity of providence. Although we clearly see here the idea of providence as divine reason in God, and hence the first element of the distinction, the execution terminology is absent in Boethius. On his account, providence is to be distinguished from fate as inherent dispositions in creatures, which are in a sense dependent on the former. But if the statement about the universality of government in contrast to fate is correct, then fate cannot be the same as government. In the Summa Hallensis and Aquinas, it seems, the term government refers to the universal execution of providence, whereas fate is to particular disposition inherent in secondary causes and hence restricted to God's government executed through secondary causes. In other words, fate in the Boethian sense appears to become a part of the general notion of government, namely the one mediated through secondary causes and hence a specific form of the execution of providence. Moreover, while this new concept of government developed into a crucial element for explaining divine providence, theologians were increasingly reluctant to speak of fate, not least because of its pagan connotations. Thus, in contrast to the former, in later providence studies, the latter notion of fate was eventually dropped. In light of this, then, it seems reasonable to consider the treatise on providence in the Summa Hallensis an innovative reworking of past masters. We have here a synthesis of Damas Zins and Lombard's definition of providence, further elaborated by an application of the Boethian notion of ratio, innovatively combined with John of La Rochelle's idea of an executio, which the Summa termed Gubernatio and employed in a new and causal context, namely the question of divine and creaturely causation in the execution of providence. <laughs>